to another dimension, a dimension of insight, a dimension of understanding. You are entering a place where reality collides with truth. There are no limits. There are no boundaries. This is Life Planet Radio. Welcome to the uh, Friday night, November 22nd version of Off Planet Radio Live, and I have with us on the line Nick Redfern, one of my favorite book authors, prolific author who over the years has researched and written about numerous subjects of interest to people like us, and he, uh, he actually seems to be able to hit timely windows in terms of releasing titles. The new book's called no- For Nobody's Eyes Only. Missing Government Files and Hidden Archives that Document the Truth Behind the Most Enduring Conspiracy Theories. And uh, it is out uh, by New Page Books. And uh, we'll give you some more information on how to find this as well. And, of course, we always post the links. Nick, welcome this evening. No, thanks, Randy. How's it going? Doing very well. And uh, your book is timely. Uh, while uh, I think the JFK assassination only makes up a small bit of the content of the book, overall the arc of this work really segues into everything about what we call the conspiracy theater um, dynamic because it has to do with hidden, suppressed um, documents that are seriously in danger now of being deleted, especially in the case of... uh, the JFK assassination uh, documents were in serious trouble with ever seeing the most critical documents. How uh, how did you, you you come into writing about this and specifically your interest in all of these these missing documents? Well, it, it was kind of just a, a case of when I was doing research on various subjects. Time and again, I would come across cases where. Um, it was clear that documentation was missing and we could actually prove it was missing, uh, which is more important. You know, this wasn't a case of somebody claiming to have seen, you know, 2,000 pages of files on Roswell or whatever. It was where we could actually prove material had vanished or been burned, shredded or whatever. And over the years, um, you know, I collected these stories, investigated them. And then early last year, I thought, well, you know, there's, there's actually a large body of, varied information here which would make hopefully a good book in terms of having different chapters on significantly different conspiracies but where the overriding thread between all of them was the issue of missing files and you know a lot of people have written about conspiracies from the perspective of what we find this book's more written from the perspective of what we know is missing and what we can prove and surmise as to why it's missing in in all of your research and um going through different documents, and I assume that you've gone through the FOIA process and attempting to access documents from different places. When did we cross the abyss in terms of this hyper-secret state where documents are withheld from the public, even documents of vital importance to the public? Again, I'll use the JFK thing, but it could be Rendlesham, it could be the documents uh, that you discuss in the book regarding uh, the death of Princess Diana or Marilyn Monroe. Um, Was this a concerted effort? Your book spans both the United States and the UK as well, and I've always assumed that we have some sort of parallel governmental system between us and um, the United Kingdom. Is there a point where we can demarcate, Nick, that that this hyper-secrecy began? Um, I'm not sure if you can, actually. And the reason being that, um, I mean, mean, the Freedom of Information Act, a lot of people sort of view it as, oh, they're just throwing us breadcrumbs. But that's actually not the case. I mean, there are still very significant files declassified through the Freedom of Information Act today. What I found is that, you know, it's not that files are, any more restricted today than they were 50 years ago. It's just that 
certain files were withheld 50 years ago and certain files on certain events are withheld today. But that doesn't mean that material isn't surfacing, if you see what I mean. For example, the FBI has a really good website called The Vault, where right. it's now loaded, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pages of previously classified documents. And every couple of weeks, they upload totally new files, um, which have previously been classified. For example, recent editions include the the FBI files on Ray Bradbury, the famous science fiction author. So, in other words, it's not like the Freedom of Information Act has come to a halt. What it is, is that these more substantial conspiracy theories, the documents just aren't surfing, but the, the point is they never surfaced, you see. So, um, in, in that sense, it's certain cases, certain events that remain hidden, but that hasn't really affected the overall... Um, status of the Freedom of Information Act across the board, you know, with everything. Now, are there similar mechanisms as well in the UK, Nick? Oh, yeah, I mean, 20 or 30 countries around the world all have near-identical Freedom of Information Acts to the United States. There's several um, South American countries, Canada, Australia, Britain, France, Germany, Holland, um, all of the Scandinavian countries, and that they're all pretty much the same in the sense that people, members of the general public or journalists, um, can apply for files to be declassified, um, or if they've already been declassified, then you know you can just arrange to have them mailed to you for for whatever the relevant fee is. The the only difference between filing a new request and filing for papers that are already released is that if you file a new request you risk the possibility of being charged for the search time to look for the documents. Mm -hmm. That's the, and, but agencies will advise you, you know, if they think if the file's an obscure one and the amount of information on the event or the person is limited, um, they may make an estimate that it's going to take sort of 12 hours of search time. And I forget what the actual figure is. So they would then say, you know, it's going to take 12 hours and this is the fee per hour. Are you willing to pay... 12 multiplied by $20 per hour, whatever it is. Um, and if you say yes, they'll go looking for the material, and if they find it and can declassify it, then they'll send it to you. Um, or sometimes they'll send it, you know, partly blacked out. And, and again, most, well, all Freedom of Information Acts around the world have similar legislation where material can be withheld in total or partially released, or in some cases fully released even, depending on the scope of the material. Can you give me an example of um, where in your research you began to note a hole in documentation? What, what jumps out as being one of the most uh, obvious? Well, I mean, for me at least, it jumped out with the UFO issue, which covers quite a bit of the book. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, the, the one that I noticed first was the Roswell case. Now, with Roswell... Um, the story, obviously, is a big one. You know, we have stories of this object, or maybe even one, more than one object, crashing on a place called the Foster Ranch in uh, Lincoln County, New Mexico, which ironically is a long way from Roswell. It's like a two-hour drive yeah, yeah. at 70 miles an hour. And it's, it's only actually tied with Roswell because the wreckage was taken to the, the old Roswell Army Airfield, which, is, which was the nearest military base to the crash site. But the, the connection with Roswell as the town is actually tenu tenuous, to say the least. Um, you know, as I said, the crash occurred two hours away. Um, but the interesting thing is that in 1993, the then U.S. congressman for New Mexico, Stephen Schiff, lobbied what at the time was called the General Accounting Office, but today is called the Government Accountability Office, um, to look into various aspects of the uh, Roswell events, because being the New Mexico um, congressman, he'd heard from his constituents how some of them were claiming to have been threatened or their families have been threatened and so on. So he wanted to know what was going on. Now, the GAO is actually a very powerful agency that can essentially walk into any other agency and say, we want to see your files on this particular issue. Um, you know, they can do audits and just check that documentation is being uh, correctly handled, etc. Mm -hmm. And so um, Schiff lobbied the GAO to look into aspects of the Roswell story. And, th and they, to their credit, credit, they did do a very good job. They went knocking on every single door conceivably possible, all, all branches of the military, the intelligence community, and even some other arms of government as well. And um, 
what they found, one of the most interesting things they found was that all of the outgoing messages from the Roswell Army Airfield from 1945 to 49 had completely vanished. They could not be found anywhere. Um, and on top of that, um, a number of other documents dating up to 1950 had gone. Now, of course, Roswell was right in the middle of this 1945 to 1949 time frame. It happened in 47. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the revelation that the files was missing was actually brought to light by the Air Force, who said, you know, we've gone looking for the files and we haven't found them, but what we have found is a huge gap. Um, and th this was perhaps one of the most notable things of all, because what it demonstrated is that somebody, at some point, we don't know when it could have been, after Schiff initiated his um, inquiry. It could have been 20 years ago, it could have been 40 years ago, we don't know. But the documents essentially were gone, and 20 years after Schiff initiated his inquiry, they still haven't been found. And that, that doesn't necessarily say what did or didn't happen in terms of the Roswell crash, but it does suggest that somebody systematically removed sort of literally boxes and filing cabinets full of material probably, in my view at least, to ensure that whatever was recorded on the, in relation to the Roswell event was all scooped up. And maybe that explains why no chances were taken and they got rid of everything from two years before and two years after just to make sure in case anything had got misfiled, you know, in a previous um, year or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, in any type of situation where you have... Um government and you have an incident is there not what is called uh, certainly in legal proceedings a chain of evidence and is it possible to detail that chain of evidence and say uh, well let's talk about files for a minute because I actually have a background in, in file security um, the, the chain of evidence between agencies or between military agencies is there a permanent record of sign-in, sign-out, creation, or deletion, or even destruction orders that you're able to locate for uh, particular documents, or is that procedure something that's not followed, or is it very um, uh, scattershot? Well, that, that procedure actually is followed. The problem is what was missing with the Roswell files wasn't just the files from that period. It was actually everything along the lines of a destruction order or, you know, something along the lines of saying, that, you know, they, these records are hereby to be transferred to this location or that location. That was the bigger problem, was that not just the documents had gone, but the overseeing documents, they'd gone as well, which made it really difficult to, you know, to chase the paper trail. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to frame this uh, question. So where do you think these files go? To, where, who do you think is responsible for deep-sixing them? Is there, like, is this military? Are they oper I guess what I'm trying to ask you is this. Are they operating under the uh, rubric of the National Security Act? Well, I mean, it's difficult to know for sure, but, I mean, I'm perhaps... Maybe, I don't know, I'm maybe one of the few conspiracy theorists who, who don't actually point the finger of the bad guys at. I, I, I don't consider the government or the military or the intelligence agencies in terms of these missing files to be the bad guys. And that might sound strange, but I'll explain to what I mean sure. by that. For example, with the Roswell files that vanished, the only reason we know they vanished wasn't because of like persistent digging by UFO researchers. The Air Force said hey, we've gone looking for these files and we've found them to be missing. So in other words, it was actually the Air Force who came out and said, this material's gone. Um, and what my personal belief is that today's military, when it comes to things like Roswell and probably things like the Kennedy assassination, I actually don't think the people in the military today and the intelligence community today know much more than we do. I think and there's no sort of hard evidence for this, but there are sort of fragments and pointers to suggest that there might be like sort of what you might call a shadow government or shadow agencies, and they're the ones, you know, the sort of deep black hidden projects that get black budget funding, and they're the ones that are sitting on the hard evidence of, of some of these conspiracies, and that, you know, the, the average general sitting in the Pentagon 
probably knows no more than we do about Roswell. You know, they're probably sitting there, ironically, might be saying to each other, you know, I wonder what really happened at Roswell. But we expect those sorts of people to know. But I think the secret has been kept so tight and so deeply because the people we expect to be in the know are actually the ones who aren't. They're not the bad guys. They're not the keepers of the secret. It, I think it really is like what they're called special access programs where you know, the, the number of people who have access is, is so tightly held that even the average employee of, as I said, military or intelligence just doesn't have clearance or need to, uh, need to know to get in there. And I would agree with you on that as well. I mean, that's been my experience. That's been my experience in working with uh, corporate uh, entities over the years as well, is that in most cases you have decent people doing their job, yeah. but that there are uh, handlers in the background, usurpers, as you say, the shadow government. And that goes very deeply into all of the uh, the conspiracy elements that we talk about because when we start talking about ufology we're talking about something that's been actively suppressed for a very long time probably before 1947 and Roswell but after 1947 I, I just always found it kind of interesting how we have Roswell in 1947 we also have the initiation of the National Security Act which actually when you look into it created what's known as the security state. In other words, there was an entirely separate governmental structure that was implemented in order to implement the national security systems. Is, do you agree with that, or, or am I just kind of reaching? Well, I mean, there's no doubt that, you know, the National Security Act was passed in 47, and the CIA came into being in 47. Um you know, you can look at it from the perspective that it related to the development, if you like, of UFO activity. But you could also, I mean, take the fact that, uh, and it is a fact that, you know, both the National Security Act and the creation of the CIA, although they happened post-Roswell, they were actually were, historically we can prove, they were planned before Roswell occurred. So, you know, it might have been sort of like really fortuitous <laughs> that uh, this was all set up and then always planned to be set up and then Roswell happened but I mean you know you can you can look at it at different ways because we do know that there were a number of strange UFO encounters during the Second World War things like the Foo Fighters and the so-called ba Battle of Los Angeles in 41 so you know there, there may have been people primed to deal with something before that time which could have had a bearing you know on, on setting up something like this well, and I've always believed that the, the 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 reason for the NSA, the National Security Act, the National Security Agency, really grew out of a very different world after World War II. The realization that we could not run the kind of open government that we had previously had. And when I say open, there's quotes around that. But relatively speaking, everything had now gone to another level. And it seems like... As that's kicking in, you're right, all hell broke loose, and all of a sudden we have this clampdown on events that we already don't understand, and people who are researchers today, like yourself, are, are, are confronted with huge gaps in our history. Yeah, and I think, you know, I mean, it's unfortunate, but sometimes, you know, I think, I, 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 ironically, as someone who investigates conspiracies, I always try and put myself in the position of the people hiding the secret, you know, and you have to wonder how many conspiracy theorists might actually do the same. You know, if your job is protecting the nation and something unknown is entering your airspace and it's clearly not the Russians and it's nobody else and it's not a domestic secret weapon, and then you hear stories about people being kidnapped or abducted or implanted, you know, cattle mutilations and everything else, you know, a sizable number of people in the conspiracy theory realms themselves might actually, if they had a position of responsibility and had been tasked with this, they might put the clamp down on it, do you know what I mean? It's um, it's one of these situations where, you know, I, as I said, I don't paint the governments as the bad guys. I actually paint them, and again, some people might not like what I'm about to say, but I paint them as I see them, as as regular people doing a difficult job, and as a, as much as I would like the truth of Roswell to come out, 
if you ask me in black and white terms, do I think, you know, at the end of the Second World War, and you're confronted with something strange crashing in the desert and all these different stories of abductions and things, you know, there is an argument to be made that them taking the approach of hiding the material was not the wrong approach to take. You know, what are you going to tell people? Oh, something's crashed, it's from another world, and we believe people are being abducted and implanted. You know, maybe people were actually saying this is for the public's own good. As much as I would like it to get out there, and I'm not endorsing that scenario, but I'm saying that may have been the approach, not the fact that they're evil people hiding the truth. It may be confronted with something so strange and potentially sinister they felt the best approach was to say nothing at all, you know, or deny it. Well, and I've had that conversation repeatedly with uh, ufologists especially. There would be no easy way to do this, and given... I've actually thought for a while now that we're kind of in a state of slow leakage of disclosure through numerous um, media outlets, not the least of which is our, our, our entertainment industry in terms of preparing us to accept certain truths that I don't think we were ready for in 1947. Well, again, you know, I mean, people talk about disclosure. I guess a lot of it is dependent on what they expect disclosure to be. I mean, you know, if... I mean, I don't have any disrespect for the people in the disclosure movement, but I do... There are a couple of things that do sort of cross my mind. One is that many people who support disclosure have already in place assumptions as to what's been hidden and what therefore has to surface. Now, if something didn't surface, um, then these people are going to say, well, it's not full disclosure because it doesn't meet their preconceived expectations. And so, in other words, let's say hypothetically, you know, abductions are real, cattle mutilations are real, there are dozens and dozens of cases of aircraft being destroyed by UFOs. We've got photographs of UFOs landing and aliens and everything else. If, if the government said that was all true, but then said, but ironically, Roswell really was a balloon, well, the disclosure movement wouldn't accept that at all. It doesn't matter how much else the government disclosed. If they didn't support the idea that, or disclose that Ros aliens crashed at Roswell, they would say uh, it hasn't been real disclosure. So in other words, the disclosure movement, I think, is a valid one, but it has to be open-minded as to what disclosure, disclosure is going to be. Don't have a preconceived mindset. And that's the problem with a lot of people in the, that movement I've spoken to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to. Just talking to them, I know they expect this to surface, and they expect that to surface. And it's kind of like trying to prove something with a negative. If the government says, well, yeah, we're coming clean, but that case actually wasn't a UFO event, you know, and it's... And then it would just, it wouldn't be disclosure. In, in their eyes, it would be, oh, it's just another layer of the cover-up. And, you know, so so I think disclosure is good in terms of the movements, but there are sort of pitfalls in it as well, I think. Well, and that's what I like about your work is that you go in with an open inquiry into things and that, you know, it is not on one level useful to point fingers uh, as we go into talking about the JFK thing. Obviously, there's some villains involved, but it's not useful to uh, alienate people on the assumption, you know, of p paranoia that everybody is, is uh, hiding things from you because, as you pointed out, yeah. there are people that are just doing their jobs. Yeah, and I think, you know, when we talk about hiding things, there's always this implication that the people who are hiding material are bad guys or evil or the enemy. You know, uh, the way I look at it is that the average person who, you know, again, I'm being hypothetical here, but the average person who might know the truth in government about Roswell probably goes home at night to his wife and kids, you know. They go to school meetings, they grill on the weekend, but they're keeping this huge secret for reasons that they may well feel are the right reasons to withhold the data. You know, they're not sort of people rubbing their hands together, you know, and dressed in black and <laughs> whatever. Um, and, and I think that's an important thing to remember, is that the sort of the, the face of what's going on behind the scenes, you know, there's, there's often this it's us versus them scenario. And I, I don't think it's that clear cut at all. It's, you know, it's an, I think it's an awkward situation for everybody involved and, it, and it's not and that's not me being apologetic it's just being realistic the way 
human life is. You know, sometimes people hide things because they feel it's for the benefit, not they feel it's, you know, oh, it makes me some powerful, nefarious person to hide the truth. You know, I think that's more sort of cartoonish like than than the real world I think very often the the other side of the coin on this is uh, of course what's been ongoing with the NSA whistleblower uh, Edward Snowden what is your take on that because see now that's the opposite side of the equation because now we're talking disclosure about what the NSA has been doing and spying on private citizens and on heads of state and other governments and other corporations as well well, yeah, I mean, I think there's two important things. One is, I think this whole issue has, has raised has raised another issue, namely, to what extent should the general public, who have no involvement, you know, in security issues, to what extent should they be watched or should they even be watched? You know, I think, I think this issue is one that probably needs, you know, a, a significant amount of debate to try and figure out where the line should be drawn. But I think equally, people have to remember the flip side. And again, a lot of people may not agree with me on this, and that's fine. That's why I have a debate. But, you know, I, I take what I do from the perspective of like a historian, and I use the Freedom of Information Act to legally get documents. I mean, you know, there's, if somebody on the inside leaks documents, you know, I don't, I should stress, you know, I don't get involved in anything like that. Um, you know, sort of leaked documents and WikiLeaks type stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I just stay totally away from that. Because one of the main reasons is purely and simply because if you have insiders leaking documents and they just take whole swathes of material and put it out there, who's to say there's not something containing that document like code words and distribution lists and, and different material that might actually allow some crazy dictator to find something in that material that allows them access into our secure systems. You see what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's not just a case of, oh, you know, let's get the information out and blow the whistle on the bad guys. It's, it's you know, p these people who leak stuff, they, they re I actually do believe they risk national security. And people might think I've been an apologist. I'm not. Again, I'm looking at it from a black and white perspective of, there could be sort of hidden words and code words and project names that even they've overlooked when they put this material out there, you know, and and it can and it can cause damage. But on the flip side, the fact that the information is out there is something that I think demands that some sort of, you know, in, inquiry around the world even, you know, because a lot of countries are sort of clamping down and watching citizens. It should, you know, now that we know what's going on, you know, I think that increases the need for debate. But to, to actually leak stuff, you know, can be a dangerous game as well. Yeah, and that's kind of my take on it as well. I mean, you're jeopardizing assets, uh, people's lives. Uh, clearly, yeah. we have intelligence agents in the field who can be compromised. Well, yeah, I mean... Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the critical issues is, you know, the, the reason I, I view a lot of these leakers as reckless, and particularly people like WikiLeaks, is that if there's ever a name of a serving operative mentioning one of these documents, and that gets into the public domain, you know, it only takes an astute, as I said, crackpot dictator to set his intelligence unit and look for that person, you know, and then score a major goal by tracking them down and doing God knows what to them, you know. Yeah. Um, all because somebody thought it was clever to, to leak a secret. So that's why, as I said, you know, I go via the Freedom of Information Act and do it the legal way and sort of looking at things historically and determining what we can from official files rather than, you know, going down the path of standing on some street corner at midnight waiting for Mr. X to turn up with a bundle of papers, which is just, you know, take, regardless of what you think about it, it's, it's, you're asking for trouble as well if you go down that path in this world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and, and it, it makes it very problematic to authenticate anything, which well, I... Well, that's I, right, and I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's another thing, you know, coming back to UFOs, is that there have been occasions where so-called leaked documents have surfaced in relation to UFOs, but the interesting thing is that rarely if ever has that attracted official attention or interest 
like for example you had the Majestic 12 documents in the 1980s um, well it isn't like Bill Moore or Stan Friedman who were you know some of the early recipients of those documents it wasn't like they were hauled in and interrogated by the FBI you know the, the government's ignored it basically and just viewed it as a pain in the neck and, and, and tiresome um, and you know so in, to what extent that means you know that there are people in government who know the documents are fake we don't know but the, the point I'm, I'm making is that because disinformation exists and there have been files that have been leaked which are questionable and which maybe were designed to push people down different paths perhaps the lack of action taken against the researchers who have these files or had them was because people on the inside knew they weren't the real thing you see what i mean um and so they just like oh well they didn't fall for it or if they did fall for it and it pushed them down a different pathway which is what maybe the people wanted then no action would be needed to take anyway because the program would be working fine and i think that's an important thing you know the difference between what's happening in today's world with stuff like snowden and whoever leaked the, the MJ-12 documents to Bill Moore in the 80s. You know, it was like two totally different scenarios in terms of how the leakage was handled. Do you, and this is an opinion I'm asking you to offer, do you, do you find any credibility in the, uh, the, the MJ-12 documents? Do you think that they were planted, fabricated, or is there truth there but we can't really identify it? Well, I mean, if, and of course it isn't, if, if aliens did crash at Roswell, then the sort of, a, the, broadly the scenario presented in the MJ-12 documents would be, I guess, close to reality. Um, but as far as the documents are concerned, I think they're interesting and they've been put together well. But I think a lot of them probably are disinformation, and particularly the later set that came out by Timothy Cooper. Um, in the 1990s, which are far more extensive, but they're also filled with a lot of errors in terms of the specific ranks that people held in the 40s and 50s and the spelling errors and so on. Um, and so, you know, there could be different motivations. I, I don't think hardly any, if any, are just put out by some UFO researcher looking to stir the pot, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think some of them have been put out to push people down the wrong pathway, even if the scenario presented might be, you know, a credible one. For example, um, if you look at the MJ-12 documents, um, in the mid to late 80s, that uh, basically tied up the entire UFO research community, or whole swathes of it, for years. Yes. And even though it supported the UFO theory, many people were focusing on those documents for years when... If they hadn't been focusing on the documents, they may well have spent more time tracking down the old timers from the base who might have been able to give a better picture. So you can make that argument that by subtly releasing something that seems genuine and is related to what you're in, interested in investigating, it looks like it's helpful. But if it actually steers you away from the people who could be more helpful because you're spending all your time, eight hours a day, forensically a analyzing the documents or whatever, then it could be, you know, a diversion, but it looks like it actually isn't. The MJ-12 documents kind of slide us into the period that overlaps the, uh, the era of John F. Kennedy. And I don't know that we can ever nail down all of the facts of what happened. Um, there have been people over the years, Nick, that have talked about for instance, the um, famous meeting between Eisenhower and aliens at, was it Holman Air, Air Force Base? Yeah. And uh, the creation of what's been called, some have called it the Greta Treaty, which allowed for a swap for technology in order to, uh, uh, in exchange for um, basically being able to take human subjects. Have you ever found any veracity to that? Is there any substance to that? Um, well, I mean, if it was real, then certainly no substance has surfaced yet. Uh, for me, the big problem I have with that theory is that if aliens can come here and abduct people and mutilate cattle and avoid aircraft and, you know, uh, affect their navigation systems or weapon systems, if they can do all that without us stopping us, why would they need to enter into a treaty That's in the first place? Yeah. 
you know, that, that, that's what I find illogical. Not that aliens might, in theory, want to, in, you know, uh, enter a treaty, but if they did, that would suggest they were on, like, a, a similar level of technology as us. You know, that's kind of like at the height of the Cold War, when, the, when NATO and the Warsaw Pact kind of grudgingly agreed to start reducing missiles. It was because both of them were at a similar level, and they both knew that neither side could win a nuclear war. Um, but if these aliens are so advanced and can literally run rings around us, that wouldn't be like NATO and the Warsaw Pact. You know, that would be like a human versus an ant. And we don't try and make a pact with ants to stay away from our front door, you know. Exactly. So, I mean, I'm not being flippant, so why, why would highly advanced aliens that can run rings around us well, even bother uh, saying no. we need a treaty? And, and I think the problem is that I've encountered people who have a, an entire, what I would call, worldview based on the very flimsy evidence that's offered for the MJ-12 documents and, you know, tangentially this this uh, whole treaty theory. And, and, and it isn't in the spirit of good research to formulate a worldview, and I've seen it very hardened, and I'm not being critical of the people specifically. I'm saying that I, I think, again, this goes into what we're talking about, which is the free flow of information and the frustration that a lot of people feel. But then we have these jacked-up theories that become uh, sort of a universe into which people operate. Yeah, and, and I think, I mean, it's like anything in life. We all have belief systems one way or another, you know. Somebody believes in God, somebody thinks, believes they're going to win the lottery one day, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. um, our lives, to some extent, are sort of dictated by belief systems. But when a belief system becomes so rigid that you're not open to other theories, and particularly when you're dealing with something like UFOs, you become a person who's easy to manipulate, you know, there's nothing easier to manipulate than a person who's, than whose mind's made up because if they're going down the wrong path but they utterly believe it's something else, you know, just um, they can be fed any sort of information and if it backs up their theory, very often they will accept it uncritically. And, you know, if they are going down the wrong path, well, they're the perfect sort of patsy to use to get the fake information out because it endorses their theory and it gets them excited and they put it out for everybody to see, you know, and um, and I think that's an important angle is to, which is why, you know, with, with me, I kind of have a, a quite a different approach to a lot of researchers in the conspiracy field. As I said, you know, I try and look at every side of the coin because, again, not truly not to be an apologist, but because I think we're in danger of kind of turning it into a cartoon, like I said, when, yeah. you know, the people hiding the truth of the evil bad guys, you know, looking like Hitler or whatever, and we're the, you know, the good guys flag it, waving the flag for UFO um, transparency or whatever. Um, and, and I don't think it is like that. I think it's a very awkward situation for everybody involved because we're all human, etc. Um, and so for that reason, you know, yes, I think whatever happened to Roswell, I think I really do 100% believe somebody is sitting on a gold mine and the, you know for, for whatever reason I don't know but that doesn't necessarily mean I know for sure what happened at Roswell you know we can glean certain things from the fact that strange bodies were reportedly found and that weird memory metal was found but we can't necessarily prove anything and so until we can I really don't think we can you know well, the responsibility is actually, actually on us not to get caught up in belief systems because as I said, that way you, you can be so easily manipulated. As somebody who's kind of done a lot of research into some pretty exotic areas, I'm curious to know something, Nick. Um, you are fairly detached. You seem to be uh, pretty cool about a lot of the things that you um, research and write about. Have you ever encountered anything that was so strange it just backed you up? like uh, emotionally to where you had to stop and go uh wow um well yeah i mean there've been a couple of things i mean the, where particularly where it gets into more what i would call paranormal areas for example when i've been doing a lot of research into ufo's one of the things that i often get is some very 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 weird synchronicities 
Mm, I'm sure most people okay. listening will know what synchronicities yes. are, but if, if they don't, you know, it's like the idea of a, a meaningful coincidence where perhaps you're working on something, you're looking for something, and you've kind of hit a brick wall, and then simply out the blue, something happens that, you know, that opens it up to the next level. Like, for, I mean, hypothetically, you're, you're looking for, um, I know, a section in a particular book that you once read. You know, you need the reference number for the book you're working on. You can't find it anywhere, and you can't find the book or whatever. And then, you know, perhaps you, you, you go on a train journey, and on, on the train, on the seat next to you is the book you're looking for. Things like that actually happen. You know, that's like a classic kind of synchronicity, yeah. as if there's some sort of guiding hand almost sort of pushing you down a particular pathway, hopefully the right pathway. Uh, but I've had a lot of that. Now, when you start to get synchronicities, where it's clearly, for me at least, it's clearly not just a coincidence. It is something more. There's like some hidden realm or intelligence we're not seeing. When you get that time and time again, that kind of, it's, in one sense, it's cool and it's weird, but also it makes you wonder about well, what is the actual nature of reality. If I can be thinking about something and I've reached a kind of a brick wall, and I'm thinking intensely about it, and then I actually get something that helps me find it. What does that say about our so-called 3D reality world? You know, it's almost like are we really living in kind of like a matrix world? You know, where you sort of reality isn't what it seems to be. I mean, that kind of thing. You know, I'm sort of pretty grounded, and you know, I have a detached life away from all this as well, which I think is important. But even mm. for that, for all that, it's like that kind of does make you sort of ponder a lot on well what is really going on if you know are we really seeing world the world and reality as it appears or, or is there something bigger going on i want to flip over a little bit there's a couple of subjects i want to touch on uh related directly to the book and uh one of them is rendlesham and yeah. that's probably not as famous here in the United States, and I'm assuming my U.S. listeners, but I know I have listeners in the U.K. and across Europe as well. But Rendlesham seems to loom out there. It's been called the British Roswell, but I don't think that yeah. does it justice. Give us a little bit of a nutshell of Rendlesham and what you discovered about uh, the the missing documents for the Rendlesham incident. Sure. Well, I mean, Rendlesham, I mean, in, in some cases, you know, or in some respects, I should say, it's, um, it is justified in being called a, a British Roswell in the sense that it involved a lot of military people and there clearly was a cover-up involved and there were different angles to the case and different sites involved as well. Um, and it's actually not that long ago, you know, it's only 33 years ago and many of the guys who were involved, they were literally only like 19, 20, 21, so they're still, you know, early 50s. In other words, nearly everybody's still alive and available for interview, which is important. Mm -hmm. um, but for people who aren't aware, aware of the full story, um, the events occurred from December the 26th to the 28th, 1980, at a series of twin bases in, on the east coast of England called Bentwaters and Woodbridge, which were adjacent to this large area of, of woodland called uh, Rendlesham Forest. Now, both bases, RAF Bentwaters and Woodbridge, were owned... Uh, by the British Royal Air Force. They're both closed down today, but um, they're both owned by the British Royal Air Force, but at the height of the Cold War, there was a US contingency in the UK to help prepare for, in, in a worst-case scenario, the Soviets launched an attack. So, in other words, Bentwaters and Woodridge were highly uh, sort of critical bases in terms of, you know, defending the UK. Um, and that's what makes Rendlesham even more interesting, and there are stories across these three nights of some of the airmen seeing strange lights in the sky. Others uh, reported seeing structured UFOs beaming lights down to the weapon storage area. The reports of a triangular shaped object moving it actually within the woods. And even reports of strange small humanoid creatures being seen in the area on the last night. Now, one of the people who was particularly interested in the Rendlesham case was a man named Lord Hill Norton, who was actually a previous chief of the uh, British Defence Staff in the early 1970s. And long after his retirement, from the late 1990s through the 2000s onwards, uh, Lord Hill Norton dug very deeply into the issue of Rendlesham and the matter of trying to find files on the case. And he actually lobbied 
the government for a number of files to be released, if they could be found, which were related to Rendlesham. And one of these files, the story surfaced in 1988 to a man named Graham Birdsall. And Graham was the... Unfortunately, Graham died about 10 years ago. He was the editor of um, a British newsstand publication called UFO Magazine. And... But George, excuse me, Graham had spoken with a guy named George Wilde, who was a senior prison officer in the UK. And British prisons are overseen by a, a government agency called the Home Office. And George Wilde confided in Graham Birdsall in 1988 that he, George Wilde, had um, spoken with another senior Home Office operative who said that on the night of the Rendlesham incidents and in that direct vicinity where you actually have three local jails, prisons, uh, two of them are regular prisons, one of them is for young offenders, that, um, that these prisons were going to be primed for evacuation. And it basically came down to something involving a national emergency in the vicinity of Rendlesham. And the one more than any other that was spoken about was a place called High Point Prison. And so Lord Hill Norton, when he heard this story, lobbied the government to, he said, you know, I want to see the governor's logbook for December 1980 for High Point Prison. And the government kind of did a grudging search for it and came back and said, unfortunately, you can't have the, the logbook because the governor's logbook for December 1980 for High Point Prison has vanished. Um, and it was never found, and no explanation was given how something as critical as, you know, the governor's logbook for that month was gone, but the other ones weren't gone. And on top of that, just a couple of years ago, um, it was shown that many of the British um, government's defence intelligence staff files, uh, the DIS is an arm of the Ministry of Defence, the DIS files covering the period of Rendlesham, they had all vanished. And what's really ironic is that what did surface through the Freedom of Information Act was um, internal documents from people employed by the DIS, where one of them actually asked, do you think it's possible that somebody sh destroyed the files to prevent the story getting out? So, in other words, even the DIS were kind of confused and baffled as to how their own files had vanished, but they had, and the... As I said, the prison files and the logbooks had gone as well. So it's very, very similar to the situation with Roswell. And kind of like when the Air Force said, well, we've actually gone looking for the Roswell files and we found them missing. That's what the Defence Intelligence staff said in England. You know, they weren't clamping down on it. They were saying, well, we don't know if there was any material on the Rendlesham case in these files, but we can't tell you if there was because they've gone. And this, again, kind of suggests to me that if there's like a shadow government or agency, it may actually be like a very powerful one that has sort of tentacles spread all around the planet. You know, it may not be a shadow government in France and another in Germany. You know, people talk about secret societies and, you know, very ancient um, secret mm -hmm. groups and things like that. And I think it could be something along those lines where you have, you know, the powerful and the rich people in government and these old families that sort of cross over into the intelligence communities. I think there could be some sort of shadow government based around like a very ancient society, secret society, I mean, that is responsible for overseeing all this. And when something significant happens, they move in and they're the ones who really call the shots on all this. Let's move it over here in the last few minutes to um, JFK and what you uncovered in the course of, uh, well, what you document in this book about John F. Kennedy, and maybe we can kind of leg that over into Marilyn Monroe and some of the exotic aspects of what she hinted at in terms of uh, what the Kennedy brothers were telling her about potential UFO uh, sure. information. Well, yeah, I mean, I think I agree with what you said earlier, but I don't think in today's world we're really going to get the full answer as to what happened. One of the reasons being that, you know, I don't think anybody would have been so stupid if, if there was like some sort of intelligence-based conspiracy. No one's going to be so stupid as to say and write in a memo, please dispatch three agents to Dealey Plaza to shoot the president, you know, and don't miss. You know, nobody's going to put that into print and paper and then sign it with their name, you know, Brigadier General whatever. <laughs> so I think you know, any sort of conspiracy, it would have been organized by word of mouth and in very couched and probably, you know, um, 
different terms that make it sound like something else was going on. You know, so I think the files that are going to surface and that are still waiting to surface may well shed further light and possibly intrigue on some of the people and the players involved, but I just don't think we're going to get that smoking gun. Now, what happened to get a lot of these files surfaced is that in the wake of uh, Oliver Stone's 1991 movie, JFK, there was a big push on the part of the public and the media to, you know, asking questions. Well, what material is still withheld? And so under the Clinton administration, there was a, an organization uh, set up called the Kennedy Assassination Records Collection Act, which led to the creation of the Assassination Records Review Board, which wasn't kind of like the Warren Commission or anything like that that investigated the events of, of, uh, of Daily Plaza, but it was just a case of trying to review all the files, put them out, and then let the general public and the media scrutinize them and try and figure out what happened for themselves. Um, and since that act was passed, you know, I mean, hundreds of thousands of pages have surfaced, but there's been no smoking gun. And as I point out in the book, one of the things a lot of people don't realize, and which may explain one of the reasons why there isn't a smoking gun, is that way back in the 70s, a lot of official files on the JFK assassination were actually destroyed, you know, and so we'll never know what was in them. I mean, one classic example is Lee Harvey Oswald's Army Intelligence file, which mm -hmm. was destroyed in 1973. Now, you know, conspiracy theorists say, well, Oswald was just a lone gunman. But on the other hand, if we had access to that Army Intelligence file, we might actually be able to say, well, here's evidence of something else. You know, who knows, that file might actually have said when he went to Russia, they had proof that he was turned by the Soviets and came back as a Soviet sympathizer and working on the orders, you know, of the Soviet government. We just, I mean, that's, again, that's hypothetical, purely and simply because we don't really know what was in his army intelligence file because he got, dished, got burned. Um, and so that's an important thing. It's not so much what we're seeing today versus what we're not seeing, but actually what was done decades ago. And that kind of ties in with the Marilyn Monroe thing because we know that she had affairs with both uh, Robert Kennedy and John F. Kennedy, and also that she kept what she called her diary of secrets. Um, a lot of people just paint her as like this sort of dumb blonde, but she wasn't. She was actually very interested in world politics. And as the FBI's declassified uh, files on her show, in the 1950s, she actually applied for a visa to travel to the Soviet Union because yes. she wanted to see personally what it was like. You know, So her image on screen is very different to the sort of behind the scenes persona and um yeah she was somebody who had a lot of emotional highs and lows and um that was probably a lot of her downfall unfortunately but um she kept this diary of secrets as it was known which contained a lot of the material and information supposedly related to her by the kennedys such as uh, the bay of pigs invasion and, and the cuban missile crisis and all that kind of thing uh, or plans to invade cuba i should say and relationships with the soviets and after she died in August 1962, um, she was uh, she was autopsied, obviously, and her diary uh, was actually one of the items that was taken to the coroner's office. And a number of people who worked there have said that they saw this large red leather-bound type book uh, diary actually brought in with her possessions. Uh, but the weird thing is that after a couple of days, it vanished. And despite the fact that even today... Um, requests have been made, well not so much requests, but I mean people have said, you know, or they put out like $100,000 plus uh, rewards if anybody can come forward with this diary of secrets, and so far nobody has. Now, I seriously doubt at the time it was just destroyed because whoever took it would clearly want to know what its contents were and how national security might have been affected by the contents if they'd been made public, so I think it probably was preserved somewhere and maybe it still is. Um, but again, it's kind of like a lot of these old files, you know, when it's more than 50 years ago and the paper trail's gone cold, it becomes incredibly difficult to know anything beyond the fact that she had this diary and it was pretty sensitive. And now it's gone, unfortunately. And that kind of applies also with stuff related to the Kennedy assassination, like um, Oswald's Army intelligence papers. You know, in a lot of ways... <laughs> As we're going through this 50th anniversary, it seems weird to even celebrate it, but I guess we're observing it and there's a point to all this. Yeah. But um, 
It strikes me that the holes in history make for some very interesting speculation, some of which I guess we can entertain. And, you know, there has been a fair amount of research done over the years. I've often speculated, and it is purely speculation, that Marilyn Monroe was perhaps one of the early Project Monarch subjects, uh, you know, basically... um, mind control subjects who were sexually programmed to interact with high political uh, uh, operatives and and figures of state. Uh, And I'm wondering, based on the story that you tell in this book about her and uh, President Sukarno, if there isn't even some logic to that. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of weird aspects, certainly, when it comes to Marilyn Monroe. You know, she did have as I said, uh, affairs with both President Kennedy and Robert Kennedy. But um, that's not the, uh, they're not the only sort of famous people. Uh, the Indonesian president, Sukarno, as you mentioned, yes. um, she's known to have spent at least a night with him. But there are also rumours that because the CIA was interested in trying to cultivate Sukarno and turn Indonesia away from communism, there are stories that... Um, they suggested to Marilyn Monroe that, you know, you might get cosy with him again and we'll say to him, well, you know, you've got another night with Marilyn if you, if you kind of turn your government away from communism. Um, that story was actually uh, discussed uh, a number of years ago by Anthony Summers, who wrote, wrote a biography on um, Marilyn Monroe. And so, you know, in that sense, we have a lot of stuff behind the scenes that we know little fragments of stories that do kind of push things in that direction. You know, it, it's not necessarily a big point, but when you put all the other stuff together, like the affairs with the Kennedy brothers and now this one, you have to wonder, like you said, you know, was she somebody primed for some particular reason, you know, sort of subliminal train into, you know, with, with world leaders, etc. In the uh, final minutes here, and I I know you didn't go into this directly in the book, but I I, I get a lot of information, and I I know that uh, several researchers out there have been sort of triangulating the Kennedy UFO aspect. Do you believe, based on your research or anything that you've come across, that President Kennedy was aware directly of UFO activity? I mean, I, I almost can't think... I almost can't even imagine that he wasn't, but is there evidence to that? Is there evidence that links in any way that this may have been a contributing factor to why he needed to be silenced? Well, as as amazing as it sounds, there actually is a lot of information linking Kennedy to the UFO issue. Um, And this is actually something I've been digging into quite deeply for a book I've got coming out next year. But, uh, I mean, I'll give you a classic example. One of the most infamous, and it probably is infamous more than famous, UFO cases of 1947 was the Maury Island event. Yes. uh, Where something reportedly exploded in the skies over Maury Island, and a couple of airmen... Um, whose job it was to take the wreckage for analysis, their plane ex- actually exploded in midair, and the wreckage was never found from the presumed UFO. Now, some people, the, the deaths of the pilots is actually provable. I mean, or is proved, you know, that's a historical yes. fact. Yes. But some people consider the case to be hoax as they think it's real. But one of the chief players in it who claimed to have handled the wreckage was a man named Fred Chrisman, who also had a background in intelligence. Now, ironically... Um, Jim Garrison, who portrayed by Kevin Costner in JFK, mm-hmm. um, Jim Garrison actually fingered Chrisman as being possibly the so-called second gunman behind the grassy knoll at the time of the assassination. Um, and that's pretty incredible that somebody linked with UFOs was actually perceived by one of the most famous investigators of the subject as the second gunman. Now, on top of that... Chrisman was associated with a guy named Guy Bannister, a former FBI agent. Um, Through the Freedom of Information Act, dozens of files, dozens of pages have surfaced of early UFO investigations undertaken by Bannister for the FBI in 1947. And even more intriguingly, the very day before he was shot, um, Kennedy opened a new wing at Brooks Air Force Base in Texas, uh, which was dedicated to the study of space medicine, you know, how the human body would react in outer space to low orbits and things like that. And one of the people that Kennedy actually had a behind-closed-doors meeting with 
at um, at Brooks Air Force Base the day before he was shot was actually the chief, the deputy chief surgeon at Wright Patterson Air Force Base in the summer of 1947. Oh yeah, which is when the bodies from Roswell were supposedly yes. taken to Wright Patterson or Wright Field as it was known at the time. And I mean, I could literally go on and on. You know, like for example, Philip Corso, who co-wrote the day after Roswell, Colonel Corso. He was actually an investigator for Senator Richard Russell, who was on the Warren Commission, um, who was actually had his own UFO encounter in, in 1955. And um, Lee Harvey Oswald, he worked for um, a company in the Fort Worth area that analysed um, aerial footage taken by the U-2, which was developed at Area 51. <laughs> you know, so there's, you can just you can literally go on and on. There are, I mean, I'm not exaggerating. There are dozens of of strange threads like that that run through the Kennedy assassination that link it with UFOs. So part of the reason why we're doing the show tonight is I wanted to put this on, on the record. I want to do whatever we can to get information out there, Nick, and, and keep pressure on our government to release the rest of the documents, some of which they've said we'll see in 2017, and some of them I doubt we'll ever see. And I think, as you've pointed out, probably... The smoking gun is not going to be there, but in in a sense, I I guess for us as a culture, we have this need to know, and what we don't know, we tend to embellish. So it's in everybody's interest to release as much of this information as possible, and for us, I guess, to analyze it and try to fit together a narrative that makes sense to us for the history books. Yeah, I would agree with you. I think, you know, people... People want the truth about whatever happened, you know, in Daly Plaza, not 50 years ago next weekend, you know. Um, they want the answers. And, and you're right, as people, when, yes, people are fascinated by mysteries, but we like to wrap them up as well. And I think, I th again, I think the problem, like with the JFK assassination, is that if somebody wanted to achieve a successful conspiracy, they would, unfortunately, from the perspective of the investigator, they would just omit from putting anything down incriminating, you know. I think the only incriminating material would be sort of guilt by association if there was something in Oswald's file that said, we believe he was turned by the KGB. Do you see what I mean? It wouldn't mm -hmm. necessarily be a document that had a direct bearing on the assassination, but it could potentially point us down, you know, a definitive direction. So I think that's probably as close as we're going to get. But that's why I think it's important these other files do surface, because they may actually give us that sort of definitive point of the, yeah, this probably was, you know, the culprit or the person or the people or whatever, you know. Well, we're going to wrap it up with that, Nick. Um, let people know where they can find you, uh, again, uh, about about the book, where they can find that and any other projects that you're working on. Okay. Um, well, the book's called For Nobody's Eyes Only. Uh, it's available online at Amazon, or you can walk into Barnes & Noble and get it. It's on the shelves there. Uh, people can contact me at Nick Redfern Fortean, which F-O-R-T-E-A-N, as in Fortean Times Magazine, Nick Redfern Fortean dot blogspot dot com, or just type in Nick Redfern at Facebook. There's, there's a few of us on there, but you'll scroll down and you'll find me. Um, and in relation to the Kennedy assassination stuff that we just mentioned, I mentioned I'm working on a book for next year. That'll come out next summer, and it's called um, Close Encounters of the Fatal Kind, and it's all about mysterious deaths in the UFO field, like researchers, authors, witnesses, pilots, that kind of thing. We need to get you back at some point. There was so much information in this book that I wanted to go over, including the, the epidemiologists and, and uh, a lot of other things, Nick, but we'll get you back to do that soon. All right, Thanks cool. for coming on. All right. Thanks, Ronnie. Thanks a lot. Take care, my friend.